All right, hello, and welcome back to a, another episode of the Chase Thomas Podcast, where I'm still the aforementioned Chase Thomas coming to you live from Knoxville, Tennessee, the mecca of college football right now. Right? Yeah. The mecca tank. Did you watch Saturday? Man, that game was crazy. I actually picked uh, Tennessee to cover, and I was like, don't be surprised if they actually beat Bama. And so uh, mm. both of my picks came through. There you go. I like it. Have you been on Tennessee all year? Did you see this coming uh, coming in the year? Uh, I mean, I've been following them. I actually picked them to beat LSU in Death Valley uh, the week before as well. I feel like they've been playing solid ball. I like the pace that they play with. They're explosive on offense, and I feel like they just continue to improve and that they'll be uh, something to deal with regardless of who you're facing in the SEC. And they proved that last week going up against Bama and beating them at home. What would you? How would you attack as a former safety NFL safety tank? Like, how would you have attacked Jalen Hyatt coming up the seam? Like, what would you have done? Do you just uh, count your blessings before it happens? Like, what is Man, what is the best uh, way to like, go about it? I mean, for him just getting explosive plays, like play mm. after play, like you just have to let him feel you. And it's tough because in today's game, you can't really touch on the wide receivers like we used to be able to back in the mm. day. Like, there's no fear going across the middle. But the thing is, is that. A lot of times he doesn't have to go across the middle. Like he's running mm. right by guys. Yeah. So I think it's one of those situations where it's kind of similar to where teams were playing Patrick Mahomes and Tyreek Kill last year, where you just lay back in the cover two shell and then just make them dink and dunk and just make 12, 15 play drives down the field and force them to make a mistake versus like giving up these huge chunk plays left and right, which is what you're seeing a lot of teams do, uh, especially against the Tennessee Volunteers. Do you think you'd be a linebacker in today's game? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm too big to play safety these <laughs> days. Uh, actually, I mean, I could still run along. I mean, my 40 time is the same as most of the defensive backs these days, but mm -hmm. I feel like just having somebody with my body type and speed closer to the line where you're better able to impact the quarterback, the run game, things of that nature, that's just the way that the game is trended. And also, the biggest mismatch to me uh, in the uh, NFL and maybe somewhat in college football today is just when you have linebackers and defensive backs trying to cover these running backs and tight ends because a lot of times say for example you have uh, a defensive player on travis kelsey like mm -hmm. he's too big for a db and uh, the linebackers are too slow so you need somebody that's kind of like a swiss army knife that kind of fits both of those categories mm -hmm. that can kind of run with those skill position players like a like a travis kelsey and a mark andrews and yet and still you know have a little bit of weight to him to where you can get physical with them is there going to be the right kind of like linebacker safety hybrid to handle the Kyle Pitts? I mean, I'm a Falcons guy. So just you mentioned mm -hmm. Travis Kelsey. It seems like we're going to get to the point in this league where every team is going to have uh, a, a Duran James. Yeah, That's exactly. who it is. Yeah. Yeah. You need a guy like Duran James who can mm -hmm. play back deep. He can play up in the run game yet and still like he's physical enough to handle like the tight ends. I mean, you saw the play where he them they did a wwe move on travis <laughs> kelsey yeah i mean so you need somebody that has like that kind of strength at the same time speed that can kind of hang with those tight ends the thing is is that they're few and far in between and that's why people would be like why would you pay him all that money he really hasn't been healthy enough and some people may have felt like he didn't really justify that contract but it's just his skill set and the need for a player like that on your defense and when he's healthy he's a baller and so you're going to see more guys with that similar skill set getting paid in the foreseeable future who do you think plays closest to you that you've watched at the safety position? Uh, I would say, like, he's already retired now, but mm. Cam Chancellor. Cam Chancellor huh. is a lot younger than me, but he was a guy that liked to come down in a run game thump. At the same time, he was capable of covering tight ends and things like that. So I felt like that was my skill set, being, mm. being a heavy hammer in the run game, having the quickness to cover tight ends uh in open space things like that so i think that's my my best comp yeah there you go roy williams another one in, more in your era yeah was, in my draft class yeah yeah my, i had a hell of a draft class roy williams went number one overall but ed mm -hmm. reed was number two i mean one of the best safeties to ever play the game uh and so yeah it was a it was a trip just trying to follow uh the things that he was doing on a weekly basis because all those guys like whether you know each other well or not you just try to keep tabs of what your mm -hmm. draft mates are doing. And Ed Reed was setting the bar that not only safeties in my draft class weren't able to do, but a lot of safeties who have played in the league way before him and way after him haven't been able to accomplish. Do you think it's harder to play safety now uh, than it was in your era? Or do you think it's the, the reverse now? 
Uh, it depends. You can't play as physically as we were able to back in mm. the day. And so from that standpoint, it's a little bit tougher. Uh, at the same time, I feel like the, the role of the safety has changed a little bit more too. Like where I feel like a lot of guys are just kind of playing back and they're a little bit more flexible to just kind of roam the field, keep mm. eyes on the quarterback because there's this emphasis on turnovers and making splash plays of that nature. Like you'll give up all the yardage teams really don't care about that. It's about clamping down in the red zone, holding mm. teams, the field goals instead of touchdowns. And more importantly, trying to get sacks on the quarterback and turn the ball over. And so I feel like most of the safeties these days are guys that, a pretty good in coverage, but more than anything else, being able to turn the ball over. That's the key. Um, with actual uh, football going on right now, um, I'm curious to get your perspective on this, Tank. Um, who do you think should be more concerned about contention through seven weeks of the NFL season? Uh, the Rams, the Bucks, or the Packers? Uh, well... All of those teams have reason to be concerned. I mean, mm -hmm. all of those teams score about as much as a 40-year-old virgin. <laughs> uh, all the defenses haven't lived up to expectations to start the season. But the mm -hmm. one thing that I can say is that the Bucks, uh, the Bucks, along with the Rams, have been dealing with a lot of injuries, mm -hmm. uh, especially when you think about the offensive line of both of those teams. Like, the Packers have been relatively healthy. Mm -hmm. Yet and still, they just haven't really played that well on offense, defense, and special teams. And it really stood out to me last week in that game against the Jets. Like, the Jets were able to block a field goal. They blocked the punt. Brees Hall had some amazing runs. Like, some of that, the scheme, like Mike LaFleur came up with some game schemes that were Yeah, you tweeted about this. Yeah. And the one trap play that he drew up, I mean, the way he was in, able to influence that defense and just create this huge gap. I guess Brees Hall is supposed to pitch the ball, but when you see a lane in the middle of the field, that wide, you just got to take it. Then he ended up mm. hitting his head on the goalpost. And then on the flip side, the New York Jets defense was just like so overwhelming to the Packers offensive line. I mean, there was one play where Quentin Williams just shoved the guard <laughs> onto like Aaron Rodgers' lap. It was like unbelievable. So for the Packers to be a team that was as good as they were last year. The only thing they're kind of really missing is Devontae Adams for them to just look this bad in all three phases of the game is pretty alarming to me. And I'm wondering if they're going to be able to get back on track. I mean, they're a heavy favorite again this week to um, beat the Washington commanders on the road. And they've been getting these, you know, heavy favorite lines the past couple of weeks and the giants beat them. The jets beat them. Like, when I look at them, I'm like, man, do we really expect this Packer team to go in there and just really manhandle the commanders, especially when Taylor Heineke was the quarterback last year when they went into Lambeau and actually played Green Bay pretty tough. And mm -hmm. so this is going to be interesting to see. I mean, this is a spot where the Green Bay Packers want to be the team that we believe they are. They need to go into Washington and put the smack down. And so I think a lot of eyes are going to be on them this week to see how they kind of rise to the challenge after the past couple of weeks. But are you going to take the pick? Are you going to take the Packers here? Or you, do you think the Commanders actually upset? Oh, uh, man, if I, if I had to uh, put anything on it, I would probably take the Commanders. Uh, I believe it was at five and a half. So I'd go plus five mm -hmm. and a half with the Commanders. Yeah. Um, do you think how much of what's going on with the Bucks is actually Brady? Is it guys not getting open? Is it just the offensive line? Because the defense has been fine. Uh, the defense is right there. And I feel like of the three, I'm least concerned of the Bucks. Um, I think the Rams just might be bad. I think we're at the point now where True. Aaron Donald playing at a just a Pro Bowl level. Jalen Ramsey's playing at a Pro Bowl level. Cooper Cup is. And they're still losing and looking this bad. That's what would scare me the most as a Rams fan is like the guys who are supposed to be making plays and supposed to be the, the linchpins of your team are playing to that level. But everybody else around them have just been so bad. And I mean, Stafford. Clearly, there's something wrong. Uh, that was. I Stafford mean, what Stafford did. is actually doing, what he normally does, though. Stafford has been known to turn the ball over. Yeah. And I mean, I think part maybe of last that year is, was the outlier. Yeah, part of that is the issues that they're having with the offensive line. But I mean, a lot of times you are who you are on tape, and then he's been a guy who turns the ball over a lot throughout his career. And I think we're seeing that rear his head again this year. But I mean, you make a good point. At the same time, I feel like Jalen Ramsey has given up some plays that we're not accustomed to seeing, even though mm -hmm. he's still playing at a high level. Like Aaron Donald is that dude. Cooper Cup is going to go out and ball out every week, no matter who they're facing. Um, but I believe it's, yeah, the turnovers and not having a compliment to uh, Cooper Cup. I mean, I think with Van Jefferson being like a major cog in that offense last year, and then when they brought in OBJ, like both of those guys were able to kind of take a little bit of the pressure 
off of that offense. They've been trying to target Higby, but they really mm. still haven't gotten too many of explosive plays uh, from anyone but Cooper Cup. So I think being able to run the ball effectively is going to be one thing. And they have the issues with Cam Makers now. I think getting the offensive line, like some of those guys, if they can get them back healthy, run the ball, that may open up some things in the past game. Just playing more sound on defense, not giving up the huge splash plays. Uh, that would help. But I will say that right now the Rams do look broken. And so hopefully they can get some things resolved over the bye week. Who are you more of a believer in uh, long term right now, the Jets or the Giants? Who do you think's tape and wins are more real as of right now? Uh, I would say probably the Jets, just from the standpoint that I like what they can do on offense a little bit more. Mm. Uh even though they really haven't thrown the ball as well with uh, Zach Wilson back, they run the ball effectively, which mm-hmm. is good. They have some weapons on the outside. The one thing that kind of threw my antennas up is that you have Elijah Moore requesting a trade right now. Mm-hmm. It made sense in training camp where you had Denzel Mims asking for a trade because, you know, you draft Elijah Moore uh, high in the draft. And then you have Garrett Wilson, who was a first round pick. You have Corey Davis, who was a former first round pick that's now playing ahead of him. Uh, and so you have all these guys in front of you. So I can see why he would request a trade. Elijah Moore, he really hasn't been that involved in the game plan. So I wonder if it's an issue where it's like requesting a trade because he hasn't been that involved in the game plan or having like a, a better understanding that of the limitations of the offense, just because mm. we really haven't seen the explosive plays in the past game and maybe questioning whether that will come to uh, come to a realization at some point, or maybe they just can't. So I'm interested to see how that the trade talk between Elijah Moore pans out. Obviously they said they don't want to trade him, but just for the Jets to be on a winning streak and then having somebody trying to find his way out of that organization, that's pretty interesting to me. But that being said, like the Giants with Daniel Jones, they have a, a bunch of injuries throughout their wide receiving core. I'm not sure how capable Daniel Jones is as a passer, especially like if you need him down the stretch. Saquon is Saquon, but then if you get some better defenses that can stack the box against him, try to take him away and then force DJ to beat you, like what's that going to look like? I don't think it's going to look that good. But the defenses play well. They give up a lot of yards in the run game. And I feel like that can come back to bite them as we get to the knee of the season, especially once you get in the playoffs. Right? You have to be able to stop the run and force the team to beat you uh, through the air. And I don't think the Giants can do that right now. Yeah, I, I agree. I think the Jets are more likely to turn the corner. And Quentin Williams has been fantastic. That defense is good. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, Sauce Gardner looks like a home run pick. Like Joe Douglas, you go up and down the list. If Mekhi Becton could stay healthy, uh, a lot's looking uh, pretty good. And Elijah Moore, it's probably part of it is just that like the way they're winning limits to what Elijah Moore can do. Uh, he's not a part of the game plan, really, because what they're doing is winning and they're playing keep away and they're taking the ball out of Zach Wilson's hands. He's not doing what he was doing at BYU and freelancing and just making something out of nothing. He's not they don't trust him to do the Mahomes stuff yet. They're just like, no, we're going to do what wins football games right now. Kind of like uh, what the Niners did with Jimmy Garoppolo, right? Where yeah, absolutely. they're just. Yep. It's that same kind of thing, but it's not going to be for everybody. Um, and it's going to frustrate guys like that. But I, I don't know. I think uh, there's still time uh, for Elijah Moore to get it figured out. And they're not, like you said, they're not going to trade him mid season. They're going to mm-hmm. maybe revisit that uh, in the off season. But um, I do have a question for you in terms of when you watch Robert Sala's defense, like with so much being offense, offense, offense across the league right now, what do you see that he does that really jumps off the page of like, oh, this is why the Jets defense is making the leap. And this is what he does. That's super cool to watch on film. Uh, I think that they've improved drastically uh, from last year to this year. Like they're 12th uh, if, as far as giving up rush yards per game, same mm-hmm. in passing 12th. Uh, but I think the key is that they're tied for the fourth most takeaways in the league. Like mm-hmm. being able- turn the ball over in this league is clutch. I mean, that's something that we were talking about uh, earlier here in the show where, like, it's so difficult to play defense now. You can't really touch the wide receivers. You can't touch the quarterbacks. Like, the key to, like, getting your offense and your team in prime positions to win games is turn the ball over. And the Jets have done a great job at that. You already spoke to the job that Sauce Gardner has been doing on opposing wide receivers. I mean, he did an amazing job against the Green Bay Packers uh, last week where Aaron Rodgers really didn't challenge him that much. And how often do you see Aaron Rodgers not challenge a rookie cornerback? So, I mean, I, I think that speaks volumes to him and then getting the most out of Quentin Williams. I mean, I think I remember seeing like 
this clip, and I'm not exactly sure what it was about early in the season, but he was like kind of in this yelling match mm. with the coach. And then yeah. you may throw up like a little, you know, signal in your head like, huh, maybe there's some issues there, but I don't know what's going on. But this dude is playing out of his mind right now, amazing ball. And I think that the way that he's able to impact opposing offensive lines and their quarterback, I mean, just plays a huge part in the success of that defense. And I think that they're going to continue to lean on him being a disruptor up front, not giving up big plays in the pass game and making teams drive the long field and beat them and just count on them making mistakes and getting turnovers. And that's what they've been doing so far. Like it. Um, If you had to find something that you don't like or is kind of alarming about the Philadelphia Eagle to this point, what would it be, Tank? Uh... You know, it would probably be them taking their foot off the gas in the second half of games. Mm. Um, because it's hard to, like, kind of argue with anything else that they're doing. They have the most takeaways in the league on defense. They have the fewest giveaways on offense. They're the fourth highest scoring offense in the league. They give up the fourth fewest points on defense. Mm. And so the only thing that I can really point to is that a lot of times they get up in games where they come out fast. And they kind of let up a little bit and they allow teams to get back in the game. I believe we saw that against the Arizona Cardinals a couple of weeks ago. And then actually let the Dallas Cowboys back in that game on Monday night before they were to kind of pull away at the end. So I think that may be one thing where if you're not playing against like some of these teams that they played against where you can kind of let your foot off the pedal and then still win a game, it could come back to bite them. But at the same time, look at their schedule coming up and they have the Steelers, the Texans, the Commanders, the Colts, the Packers, Titans. I mean, there's not a lot of teams that scare you right there. So until there's really someone that's going to like kind of force them to play with a little bit of urgency, I'm not sure we're going to see that. But as of late, they're good enough to overcome that. So kudos to them. They're one of the better teams in the league. Uh, team you're quite familiar with, the Tennessee Titans, who you were drafted by in the second round years ago, uh, Tank. Are the Titans still the favorites? Because it seems like every year we just go into it where it's like, okay, the Colts. Or this year, I had the Jags win the division this year. Mm-hmm. And I'm still waiting because I just, I'm a big Trevor Lawrence guy and a Doug Peterson guy. And I think uh, that flip's going to happen. It kind of like Deshaun Watson in Houston, where it's like, even if you were not a fan of what was going on around the team, where you're like, uh, he's having to do too much, it's like, just him alone the talent alone is enough in that kind of division to just win it every year like you just not the roster to win a super bowl but enough to get there and to get to the playoffs and win the division and i think that's where trevor lawrence his talent is but like tennessee just keeps winning the division <laughs> derrick henry mm-hmm. is still derrick henry this year and i mean they move on from aj brown and it's hard to bet against the Titans right now. Like, are you still on the Titans should win the AFC South train? Or have you seen enough where you're like, maybe it could be the Colts. I mean, Matt Ryan, number two in passing. Could it still be the Jags? Um, where are you at with the Titans? I think it's wide open. Uh, mm. The Titans have won the past couple of games because Derrick Henry has rushed for over 100 yards in those games. And I'm really surprised that that's the case because there's really no threat on the outside to really scare a team and force them uh, not to, you know, stack the box and try to take away the run. So I'm surprised that he's still been able to have that success because Robert Woods doesn't scare you. Traylon Burks, like he's on IR right now. There's really no one else that scares you in the past game. So for him to still be that effective on the run is, uh, in the run game, it's pretty uh, surprising to me. That being said, like, I feel like the AFC South is so wide open because we've seen that any team could beat each other. Mm-hmm like the Texans going to Jacksonville and they beat them. And I was like singing the Jags praises early in the season because I felt like they're playing sound ball on defense. And then Trevor Lawrence and Christian Kirk were looking like a younger version of Justin Herbert and Keenan Allen. I mean, yeah. The connection that they had early in the season. I thought they were going to continue to build on that. Yet and still, like if you want to be able to challenge for a division title, make the playoffs and challenge for championships, like you have to play consistent ball. And obviously the Jags losing to the Texans and then also losing the game to the Colts that they should have had. I mean, you know, that's tough. Um, That being said, the Colts seem like once they get healthy that they should be the team to beat because they've been missing Darius Leonard on defense. They've been missing some other guys on defense. So I feel like the defense can improve. Matt Ryan has shown that when his wide receivers are healthy, he can push the ball down the field, like throwing for 389 yards. And like what three tubs last week? Like that's impressive. I don't think many folks still 
felt like Matt Ryan had that in him. Especially still had it. No, I'm right here. Uh, still, <laughs> I still believe her. Matt could do it. Yeah. And then also now you want to get Jonathan Taylor back too. Yeah. So, I mean, if they're able to run the ball effectively and then you still can like have some of that success in the pass game, the Colts can be dangerous. But I think we're going to be able to tell a lot from this matchup this week. They have to go into a hostile environment, go and play in Tennessee and try to take away a win since the the Titans beat them just a couple of weeks ago in Indianapolis. So it's going to be an interesting game to watch. Uh, we'll end on this tank. Uh, in your NFL career, who was the hardest quarterback to read uh, at the line? Who was it? Who was the most difficult for you to, to get a good read on? I mean, for me, like there was always like an extra emphasis put on the game plan whenever we would face Peyton Manning. And hmm. I mean, we had to face them twice a year too, since yeah. they're in our division. And so that was always a challenge because I mean, guys like him, they know every defense in the book. And so we mm. try to make everything look the same at the snap and then either try to roll into a coverage just to try to, like, make him just pause for one second and maybe that'll give our rush enough time to get to him because if he knows what you're in at the snap, then he's going to know exactly where to go with the ball and he's going to pick you apart. And so it was always a challenge facing Peyton because we faced him twice a year, so both of the teams were familiar with each other. But at the same time, I mean, you play against Tom Brady and some of those other quarterbacks. That was a challenge as well. But Peyton gave us headaches twice a year. Was that one of your five picks? Did you get one off Peyton? Yeah, yeah, I actually did. I got What one was off the play? Uh, on that one, he was just going to Marvin Harrison. He was going uh -huh. to Mar Marvin Harrison on the deep route. I think I was in the post. Uh -huh. And I was able to kind of get back and track the ball down. And I intercepted it in the end zone. Okay. So. There you go. There you go. Um, Stanford, man. Uh, what's going on? Like, is it is it turning around? You beat Notre Dame, which is good, but yeah, I don't know if I say it's turning around. I mean, I think the one issue that Stanford's going to have is dealing with like the NIL and yeah. then the transfer portal stuff like that because it's already tough for guys to get into Stanford. Mm -hmm. And you see, like USC is the perfect example where you have Lincoln Riley move from Oklahoma to USC, and then Caleb Williams follows him, and then all these other players from yeah. all these different universities just follow him there. And then all of a sudden, like USC is just this team that's challenging, you know, to make the playoffs until they got knocked off uh, by Utah last week. But Stanford can't really do that. We can't uh, kind of recruit consistently recruit those top level guys one to get them into school and they're definitely not going to transfer i believe we had the only one guy that transferred through the portal where a mm. lot of other teams average a lot more than that yeah. so from that standpoint it's a challenge but we beat notre dame and so <laughs> hey, that's almost like winning a bowl game in my book so we'll take it <laughs> are you involved with any of the nil uh, with stanford to this point or no no nah. nah. Hmm. Well, maybe you never know. You got Richard Sherman, Andrew Luck, a lot of big, I mean, Bryce Love. Stanford's put out a bunch of players over the years. I mean, yeah. your first team all pack 12. I mean, there's a lot of talent that's come out of uh, the state and they've gotten quarterbacks. I mean, Davis Mills was the five star quarterback uh, in my home state out of GAC and Andrew Luck goes there. I mean, they get talent. It just feels like it's so random. Stanford's just a really random program where they get the the big players, and you're like, oh, they've got like three first rounders on this right. on this current <laughs> roster, and then you never hear from them again for another five years. It's it's really weird. Uh, they're a weird. And, and, and that's and that speaks to like how tough it is to kind of recruit consistently because mm -hmm. of the academic requirements. I mean, that speaks to it right there. Tank, what can the good folks check out from you over on Yahoo Sports uh, this week? Oh, well, you can always find me on our uh, Fantasy Football Live show that airs every Sunday morning, an hour before kickoff. You can also follow me on Twitter at TankWilliams13 or on uh, Instagram where I post a lot of content, whether it's fantasy football, uh, betting, a uh, little college football and NFL. So everything you want to know, pigskin related, I'm your man. There you go. Well, this has been great. I'm glad we're able to make this happen today. Uh, good luck this weekend, and we'll have to reconnect again soon. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. It was a pleasure. Yeah.